Hi, welcome to the Lead by Design show. I'm your host, Dev Singh. I have a question for you. What does it mean to lead by design? Exploring that question is the basic premise of this show, where I speak with inspiring leaders about leadership, design, agility, innovation, and many other things in between. I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I did, and I hope that in some way it inspires you to be a more mindful and conscious leader in your own life. Welcome to the audience. This is my first conversation on the Lead by Design show, and I'm extremely excited to have Dr. Anne Stenros here. I'm going to very quickly introduce Dr. Anne Stenros with her bio. Dr. Anne Stenros is a thought leader and an architect with a doctorate in technology. She has over 25 years experience in creative leadership and strategic design. Between 2005 to 2015, she acted as the first design director at Cone Corporation, a world-leading elevator and escalator company. In 2016 to 2018, she was appointed as the first ever chief design officer, CDO, of a city, namely the city of Helsinki. She has also had a professorship in creative leadership at the Aalto University. She has participated as an expert role in many different EU forums, and she was the member of the World Design Capital, WDC, 2022 Selection Committee by World Design Organization, WDO. Currently, she is speaking, lecturing, writing, mentoring, and catalyzing change. She's curious about the future of cities, architecture, and urbanism. She believes in collaboration, co-creation, and creative collective. A lot of things that I'm very passionate about, but mostly I'm so excited to have you here, Anne, because right from our first conversation in preparing for this, I mean, I was excited by your profile, but I'm even more excited by your and inspired by your passion about the topics that you speak of. Thank you so much. I'm really honored to have you here. Welcome to Lead by Design. Thank you, Dev. Uh, it's my pleasure too, because during our first discussion, I remember I had this feeling of meeting on minds, and that's also always very inspiring, you know. So thanks. I'm happy to be here. So, and like I said in the intro, I did a lot of prep for this conversation as well. A part of that was going through a few of the articles that you very generously shared, but also I watched a couple of your interviews. I watched your talk at the Service Design Conference, I think it was, from 2017, just after you had started your CDO role with the- Long time uh, ago. <laughs> yeah, probably these days, it feels like it's certainly been a long time, especially in this day and age. I was hoping I could read something from an article that you shared with me, and we could actually start there if that was okay. And I have a specific question after I read this, uh, this part of, um, of something that you wrote. Would that be okay? Okay. Yeah, please. <laughs> Great. So these are your words, but in my oh, voice. Oh my goodness. All right. This is, <laughs> Let they're me. beautiful words. I was so inspired by this. <laughs> so this is a, it's a part of an article and I'm hoping that we can share the whole article with the, with the audience in the show notes later, but here goes. I ended up to the Finlandia Hall for listening to the orchestra with a world-famous conductor managing the tempo in the front. On purpose, I was sitting on the last row, high above, to have as much open space as possible in front of me. Therefore, I had the full view of the orchestra with the fan-like layout of the different instrument sections, strings, woodwind, brass, and percussion. And suddenly, I realized the familiarity of the vibrant setup on the stage, it was like me and my design team. Me as a conductor giving the tempo and the sound and the team of experts playing together in a wonderfully rich way. Finally, I knew what kind of team I'd love to have and what kind of leader I'd want to be. The orchestra with the conductor. The only thing that I intuitively knew, this was a little bit later in the article, the only thing that I intuitively knew was that I didn't want to create an ordinary waterfall model for the creatives I will hire during the years to come. Personally, I knew that fitting designers into a traditional and strict organizational model will kill their creative capacity. The one-step difference that the conductor has in front of the orchestra, the conductor's podium, is only for better visibility. It's not about the role or the rank. It only allows me, as a conductor, to see better if there's a problem somewhere that I have to help to solve. And it also allows the team members to see the bigger picture that they're part of. I really love that. And I have actually a bunch of questions that I want to ask you, but I'm hoping that you could tell me 
why do you think that fitting designers into a traditional and strict organizational model will kill their creative capacity? Well, um, that uh, chapter or <laughs> this um, a text that you read, it's a real story from the beginning of my career as a design director at Kone Corporation, one of the leading elevator and escalator companies in the world based here in Finland and global work, of course, practicing globally. But when they ask me uh, what kind of organization I would like to build there, because I was the first ever design director uh, in that company, in the whole history of the company, and it's over 100 years old. So I thought that the only thing I don't want to do is to have a kind of very strict uh, fixed format for my creatives. Because as a creative by myself, I knew that, um, you know, the, those people, they are never ever loyal to any organization. They are loyal for their vision and they are loyal for their learnings. They want to grow in their role. So I thought that if I put them into a tiny boxes <laughs> that are below me, <laughs> nothing will happen. Nothing will come out of that. So I wanted to maximize the freedom for them because they are each individual creatives, right? So they have to have their time in stardom, meaning that when the orchestra is playing, you know, sometimes the violins, they have the solo, sometimes the drums, sometimes you, you name it, the flute or whatever. But every single person should have their solo uh, time. So I thought that this box model, the waterfall model is not for me. And when I uh, went to explain this to the CEO of the company, he wanted, he asked about the organization. He wanted to see what kind of model I'm going to create. So I told him this uh, metaphor of orchestra and uh, how I realized it when I was there in the Finlandia hall listening uh, uh, to this piece of music and uh, how the conductor was performing. Uh, so I told him and I show a picture, a chart of an orchestra and I put myself there below how I'm supporting the, the rest as a kind of a tree, you know, growing upwards. And there was complete silence. And then he said that, okay, you can do it. And two months later or three months later, I noticed from the website that he has used exactly the same model for describing the organization in Kone in general. So I thought, wow, All right. <laughs> designers, we can do it. That's fantastic. <laughs> If we, if we take a step back from that, uh, I have a more fundamental question. What is design leadership and how is it different? So actually, I want to ask a few questions and maybe you can choose how you answer one or all of them in combination. So the first question is, what is design leadership? How is it different to not design leadership or any other leadership? Is there even a distinction or is every leadership actually design leadership? Uh, what is the difference between design leadership and creative leadership? Because I noticed whilst you wrote, you know, whilst you've been chief design officer and, and there certainly is an emerging discipline and people talking about design leadership more and more over the past five to 10 years, particularly past five years, I would say, in my understanding, uh, you, you speak quite a bit about creative leadership, which leads me to a question, should all leaders be creative? And should leadership by default be creative or is creative leadership something different? Well, first and foremost, I see leadership as a process. It's not a role for me. When I started as a young one years, years ago, I took it for granted somehow, the role. I, I sort of inherited it actually basically from my father who is uh, an architect and he used to have his office. And his way of leadership was something that I, I highly, highly respect because there were a row of uh, tables, the big white ones, you know, at that time architects uh, used pen and pencil oh, yes. only <laughs> sure, <laughs> when I started tables. my career. Yeah. yeah, so it was one, one by two meters, so it was huge. 
and they were on row. And because I was the youngest the junior during my summer holiday break from, uh, from the university, I was sitting in the last <laughs> table. <laughs> and um, right, so w- with your morning, dad, with your father. No, no, but in the office where where the architects, my my father has a separate right. room. Then there was the okay. big hall with the tables. Okay, and I had the last mm-hmm. one always. So in the morning, my father he came to the um, uh, to the office and he started his journey uh, from table to the next. So he took a chair and was literally sitting there next to the young architect or the senior architect who was responsible for the project and helping to solve the problems. So he was sitting there next and they were drawing together how to fix this or how to solve this or how to redesign this or whatever. And step by step, he ended to my table too and showed me how I can do it better. And then only after that, after midday, he went to his own uh, desk and started to do, you know, the, the other, other things like uh, leaving the, the office or whatever. But, but the idea that he was one of us, you know, not something different, but he was among us trying to solve the problems. I think that is somewhere very deep in my heart, what comes to leadership. And later I realized that, um, okay, it's a design leadership because uh, you know I was a design director, but I rather talk about creative leadership because it gives more room because everybody can be creative. You know, every leader can be creative mm-hmm. leader in many respects. But then yet another step, some years later, I started to think about that leadership is about change. It's about transformation, personal transformation, transformation of your team or the whole culture of the company. That's the only thing. So the leader must see somewhere to the future in order to give direction to the whole organization. So whether you want to call it creative leadership or design leadership or change leadership, I mean, it, it depends on in what phase you are in your journey towards leadership. And in the end, I gave us a kind of headline, I think uh, last year, in the end of last year, I, I found the word learning leadership meaning that there is an evolution, ongoing evolution, when you get into the next and next and next phase of your leadership journey. You start like a managerial Mm. position, and then you become a coach for a team, and then you become, you know, change maker for the culture, uh, let's say, within an organization. And eventually, maybe you become a master, giving advice to other people teaching, sharing your knowledge. You were you began your career as an architect, and in a sense, you were a creative professional before you were a creative leader or in a formal, specific creative leadership role as a chief design officer or director of design before that. When you went into this creative leadership roles, whether it's director of design or, or chief design officer or all of the roles you may have had in between and before. Do you think it helped that you were a creative professional before? And were there some fundamental lessons that you got as a designer or as a creative professional that helped you be a better leader? To be honest, uh, I'm uh, very privileged because as I mentioned, my father is an architect and emeritus professor of architecture. Mm. Also, I went to another university for sure, very far away (laughs) from where he was teaching, (laughs) of course. (laughs) But as far as we yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) I ended up to Berkeley, California. (laughs) So, uh, but the other thing is that my mother is one of the leading figures of the furniture design in golden era in 1950s, 60s, 70s. Her furniture range 
is uh, 70 years old this year. We are celebrating it in our family business. So I have inherited design and architecture in an equal basis in my life, so to speak. So I didn't realize that, but when, uh, when I started to study architecture, but later I have noticed that I was always referring myself and my designs to the colleagues of my father that I met in the office. See what I mean? That my bar was higher all the time. I didn't refer myself to the <laughs> peers, peer students around me. No, I was always referring how I do comparing to the, the architects uh, that, uh, that uh, were practicing. So that's why I probably, I, I'm used to challenge myself always, you know, to the next. Mm. And whether it's good or bad, well, one can uh, think that later, later, of course. But, but that also helped me to realize that this step from architecture to design leadership, it's no step at all for me. Because I was so used to it that we discussed in the dinner table both architecture and design. And I, uh, it, my parents even shared an office for a while when I was a kid. So I was playing there with, with all the, you know, uh, paper and pens when they, my father was doing open architectural competitions on weekends. So I was doing my own competitions there. So... Wow. <laughs> So it helped me to understand that uh, there are no limits. It's a blurred something, you know, the, 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 the division between design, creativity, architecture, leadership. Like I said, that my father was sitting there next to us and, and solving problems. So for me, leadership is or was like solving problems together. Mm, creatively that. that yeah yeah so it's not a role for me it's a way of life and that's the difference that's the difference Wonderful. and that's why if you don't have room and space for your thoughts in some uh, organization and it's your life it's going to kill you you have to leave you, mm. there's no room for breathe so one day I got the idea after 10 years at Kone because I couldn't find anything new to learn anymore. So I realized, and it's time to move on, to take, you know, another challenge. So I think it's very important for every leader to first and foremost lead yourself, to have this self-leadership and to see when you have grown out of something, and also you have to understand that whatever people are saying, wow, we have a fantastic project here, or we can hire you, come here and join our organization. But if there is a mismatch, if their expectations are below your growth potential or your journey, it's not going to work or vice versa. If they are expecting something else and you are able to deliver something else, it's no match. Okay. So in my mind, uh, like I said, that you have to start from yourself. And here I'm referring when before this uh, recording, I, I told you a story that two days ago, I did a vision map for myself, a kind of collage. Yes. I cut out the pictures from uh, magazines and put them together, me flying on the sky on the top. And uh, then there was uh, Stephen Hawking's down there on the ground <laughs> <laughs> saying something about a time and next a chapter. But this means yeah. that I'm still trying to understand my role and position on my leadership journey through, let's say, this kind of vision map or anything I try to do. I'm rewriting my journey. And I'm happy to share that with others if, if that will help them uh, on their journey. I think it, I think it certainly will. It's very inspiring. I like to, I like to talk of shared leadership as a concept quite a bit because I think uh, the foundation of creative problem solving 
has to be shared leadership when a team or a group of people is working together and there is some sense of everybody can take personal responsibility for bringing their individual personal vision to the table and everybody can leverage off the collective strengths of that group and and as as you know from our uh, previous conversation uh, i'm also a strong advocate for this idea of self leadership being the foundation to that shared leadership and really getting to know yourself but also being open to consistently evolving and it's interesting when i look back retrospectively how much unconsciously i've picked up these concepts and notions from from disciplines and fields and areas of design and creative problem solving and it made me really curious to to ask you and maybe you've had this experience that if you work with a leader or an aspiring leader somebody who wants actually wants to be in the position of wanting to be a conductor in the way you put it not necessarily someone who's aspiring to be in a more senior management position just somebody who wants to be a conductor with an orchestra in a in a nice way what can they learn from creative disciplines or design or service design or strategic design that would help them become a better leader even if they're not working in a creative field themselves well i want to go a little bit back in the idea of back in time in uh, in the golden days of design thinking well okay. i have struggled all my life with the idea of design thinking <laughs> and i i still remember when i was in front of the eu audience uh, i think it was uh, 2014 before i joined the city of helsinki uh or something like that and i stated that uh, design thinking is dead <laughs> long live design thinking meaning that uh, i have my doubts around that and then mm. there were several people you know that uh, after me they said oh i'm so relieved you said it and da 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 you know and the organizer was looking green because it was the headline of the whole <laughs> seminar was <laughs> design thinking something plus <laughs> so when something becomes mainstream that everything is actually design thinking or anything goes under design thinking it's it doesn't um uh, deliver any more anything basically that's my idea that if it, it's a diluted so i uh, i started to think about last year when i uh, went through my design library here i i rearranged the books a little bit and took some out of the old boxes and i realized wow i have this classic book this one oh this is my favorite designer and i have the book here and i started to browse them and i thought about the the words of wisdom you know that how relevant they still are and how how much they speak to me even the book was published 10 or 15 years ago but it's a kind of there is this classical wisdom that is relevant after years and years so i started to think about this related to the idea that let's do these things together this endless collaboration co-creation co-development that we do together everything uh, everything is fantastic every people uh, should be happy and we experiment and blah 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 and what comes out of that tell me question mark how many innovations really has come out of have come out of this kind of uh, co-creation this based on design thinking it's more incremental if if you want to uh, let's say uh, improve something fine use design thinking and do it collectively co-creatively and it's a done but then there is this idea of conductor what he actually does he is using old vocabulary of uh, music i mean he is he is not creating the music by himself the notation comes from mozart or bach or whatever see what i mean but he gives mm. life for that through his vision so he is the auteur for that performance he is using the musical language as we all know it but at the same time under his guidance 
this um, moment, this definite moment in the time when they are performing is, is a creative act. And he is the auteur that is giving the tempo, the rhythm and the richness to the sound. So in my mind, in the future, we are moving from this co-design uh, more to like, a, uh, or non-design to strong design, meaning that we will need the auteur who is going to be responsible for that design or going to be responsible for that transformation or that change or that leadership. But the person who is taking, willing to step out and take that responsibility that comes with leadership. Because whatever your team or the organization is doing, your face is first there. You can't fail them. Mm. You must uh, show your face. And for example, when I was uh, leading the design team at Connect, the global design team, my team didn't know how many times I protected them. They don't know. And I'm not going to tell. But I felt that, that I'm like a snowblah. You know, in Finland, we had this snowblah taking, uh, clearing the way out of heavy snows. Yeah. And my people, they are coming after and they can do all the fun thing because I have done the hard part. Yeah, giving the freedom mm. and way for them. So in this respect, all leaders, I think that they have to sign this uh, a, tour, a tour contract that they are responsible with their voice, their face, whatever happens. And if you are not right. willing to do that, then I mean, leadership is probably not for you because it's tough. Mm. And like I said, it's a, it's a lifetime commitment. If you step on that journey, it's very, very hard to step out of that later. So based on what you just said, are you, are you feeling that at some point in the future, the role of a design leader, like a chief design officer in any organization, would be redundant because design would be more uh, ephemeral throughout the organization and every leader would take responsibility for good design? Or is there still a role for a design leader specifically? And if so, what is that? Sorry to say, but the time of chief design officer is over. Seriously. Okay. If you look at Apple, what happened? Johnny Ive left. Mm -hmm. If you look at 3M, what happened? Eric Quinton, he quitted. And, you know, even Connect Corporation doesn't have a replacement for me. So I think that that momentum that we have chief design officers that so to, that's gone now because every single thing is so complex and uh, and so uh, the the whole context today especially now after pandemics is uh, almost chaotic so we are not living anymore the VUCA world we are living VUCA world meaning that there is this not only complexity but chaos present all the time so uh, nobody can do it alone, basically. That's the idea. But I think that it would be interesting to highlight a, a thing. Last fall, I created uh, four personas of the future chief design officers, you know. They were quite moderate ones. I was playing around the idea that if we are going to get this kind of future, that kind of future, and I, I created the idea of maker and, uh, you know, all these uh, quite uh, standard ones, how they are dealing in the future. And it came uh, up that the systems thinking is going to be the big thing, right? So that you understand the complexity and you can uh, really collaborate with different disciplines and, and put all those things together for one vision, because that's the, the way how creatives work. They try to create the vision. But later now, uh, just, uh, you know, a uh, few weeks ago, I created two more personas around the idea okay. of future design officer. Now, All and right. they this are a little... press, an exclusive. 
<laughs> yeah, and they, yeah, they are a little bit more radical. Uh, the fifth one is Eric, and he is a transformer. Uh, and he, he is not just system thinker, but he is complexity thinker, because everything goes more and more complex and network and all that. And I can uh, read here a little bit if you are interested. Yeah, please, that. please do. Yes, That's, yes, absolutely. Yeah, Eric is transforming the world one project at a time. His enthusiasm and collaborative skills are gaining partners, friends, and collaborators in different fields. He is a system thinker by nature, lifetime learner, open-minded, and curious of several disciplines. Also, his passion is in design thinking well, should be now something else, and how to apply that to grand challenges and mission projects. Currently, he is occupied by a major pan-European mission-led research project on food tech and the future, food, uh, of future of food production. Eric is a professional transformer. And then it goes on. Uh, I refer to his heroes, like Don Norman, for example, and then in the end, there is a chapter in 2035, so 15 years uh, from now on. Eric is the chief system officer, CSO. He is not chief design officer. He is chief system officer of the EU Systems Innovation Lab. He oversees the mission-led innovation programs aiming for societal trans transformation in EU. Like his hero, Don Norman, Eric has published several books about strategic design and societal transformation. He is an advisor for several governments and public organizations. His latest book is titled Designing Constant Chaos for Greater Good or for the Common Good. So I think that this is the, this is the way uh, I see one role for a, C a chief design officer in the future. He or she is going to manage or run the system, system of system. I, I think that this means in the future that you must become a kind of systems thinker and a generalist so that you understand other disciplines very well because you are dealing mm. with the different ecosystems and trying to create something bigger out of that. And I also love the idea of Mar uh, Mariana Machucato about mission-led projects that are kind of grand challenges and you gather different groups and disciplines together to try to collaborate and solve it. Like she said that the Man to the Moon project was in 1960s. In the same way, I think that uh, designers or uh, design directors are going to, to work in the future. But taking this to the next, next level. So if this is after, so the next that comes after that is a warrior. That's my favorite one. And here I can okay. and read a short description. Emma, she is a Shiro, a Shiro, not a hero, but a Shiro. Okay, Emma is living in Berlin. Emma is a designer empowered by minorities and vulnerable people. See she herself as a voice of those who are unable to speak. Her mission is to make world more diverse, equal, inclusive, and just. She is volunteering in different projects from environmental to social sustainability, and her passion is co-creation together with people. Currently, she is involved in a feminist city project, trying to make a local neighborhood safer and more meaningful from a female perspective. Emma is a shero with a warrior spirit. And now, if we go, uh, you know, 15 years later and meet Emma. So in 2035, Emma is the first Chief Inclusive Officer, CIO, Chief Inclusive Officer of the City of Berlin, being responsible for the program to prioritize diversity, equity, and inclusion in the citywide approach among communities, services, and neighborhood development. 
Her local activist initiative, City Life Matters, We Are the City, has been copied around the world as an example how to co-design cities with people. Emma is the youngest person to get the gold medal of the city of Berlin for being a role model in radical urban activism. And of course, uh, her hero or shero is Jane Jacobs, the great urban, uh, uh, the great pioneer in citizen urbanism. So in my mind, this is, you know, related to the discussion of ethics, of course. And there is a recent wonderful uh, podcast uh, by uh, Don Norman, where he was talking about that ethics and politics are the most uh, important topics uh, for designers. So mm. I, I was highly, how should I say, influenced by him. But I think that this chief inclusive officer and this chief, what was it, chief system officer, that they are chief system officer and chief kind of, yeah, yeah, so that they are this, representing the future, as I can see that the design uh, leadership is going to. But to take care of those mm. who, who doesn't have a voice, I think that has always been part of designers' work, to represent those. And then also how, as an architect, I can fully understand that I can't build the you know, a big building by myself, but I have to orchestrate all those different disciplines that can make it happen based on my vision. So the authorship comes from that, as you can see. Right. Being able to conduct many different instruments and musicians yeah, as well. Yeah. And get the sound as, well as you want to see it. Because many yeah. uh, people can see the difference who is conducting the, let's say, the first violin concert of Sibelius. It's completely different if it's played uh, by this orchestra mm. conducted by him or her or the other orchestra, you know, it's completely different. Hey, hope you've been enjoying the conversation so far. If you want to take a pause, now would be a good time, but I hope you'll stick around and listen to the rest of the conversation. And only now so, there has been female conductors. See, see, the, this is uh, this is much the same in the field of design. I think uh, there are yeah. there are two chief design officers, female ones, and I'm the other one. I, I know you're very passionate about this topic, and I, I have a couple of specific questions about this that I really want to ask. But before getting into that, I, I really want to I want to really acknowledge the exercise that you did leading up to reading what you just read, because it's so inspiring in many ways, but there are a few things that stand out to me, not even just the content of what you've written, but the idea that you sat down and thought about an avatar and an archetype, if you will, and then thought about not just what is the vision for that person now, but what is that vision for that person in the future uh, in a period of time, which I can imagine inspires you to think into the future about how that person is going to grow, which speaks to what you were saying earlier about leadership being about uh, learning and constantly and consistently evolving your understanding and your uh, contribution. And then the other thing is, is that you, I love the fact that you, uh, you talked about inspirations and role models and heroes in those descriptions, in those stories that each of these people have certain role models, certain heroes that they look up to. Uh, I find that a very fascinating concept, particularly in this day and age where we're surrounded by YouTube and TikTok celebrities, Instagram celebrities, people who are considered influencers but are very superficial in their right. Uh, I actually feel like the younger generation, and I'm including myself in, in this as well, but but particularly even more younger generation, really struggle to find heroes and role models that they can actually learn from and actually develop themselves as people from by saying that this is somebody I can I can commit to 
to really studying and shadowing over a time period and not necessarily a real life person. It, it could be, or I should say, not necessarily a, an alive person. It could be an author from the past. It could be a, a thought leader in a particular discipline. And it's not necessarily someone that you have a personal direct contact with, but somebody that you can say, as you mentioned, Don Norman, or this person is going to shape my evolution and growth, or at least influence where I'm going to end up in 15 years time and 20 years time. I found that incredibly inspiring. So thank you for sharing. That. Uh, may I tell a, a story related to that, how I realized how important of the heroes are for, for our development. I, I love uh, yeah, architect please. Louis Kahn because he's not just a, you know, a remarkable mm -hmm. architect, but, or was a remarkable architect, but he was also a philosopher. And uh, from him, I learned that architect can write. We don't just have to draw, but we can <laughs> we can write our own text and and think aloud what architecture right. is. So uh, there is a beautiful story that I read years ago about Louis Kahn, uh, that there was a young Indian uh, architect who uh, worked uh, in his office during the years that he created the beautiful buildings for um, for. I think it was from a uh, for, was it Kandigar? I think, yeah, or some other part of. Now I have to think about it. Maybe, maybe <laughs> you know better than I do. But nevertheless, okay. we, can, we can look it up later and put it in the notes. Yeah, we can look it up later. Yeah. But uh, there was also buildings designed by Le Corbusier uh, in that same city, mm -hmm. and. Uh, so this young Indian architect, he worked uh, for a while in uh, the office of Louis Kahn and for a while in the office of Le Corbusier to, to do this, design these buildings. And then Le Corbusier died. And that young architect, he wanted to visit Louis Kahn in US and he traveled all the way there. And the Louis Kahn has this habit that when somebody ring the bell downstairs, he was living on the top of the uh, huge building block. So he dropped the keys from the balcony. You know, if he noticed that the person was okay, a friend of his, right. he dropped the keys <laughs> downstairs. So uh, the young Indian architect rang the bell and uh, got the keys from the balcony and went uh, in to the apartment. And he know, noticed that Louis Kahn was sitting there in an armchair and he was looking so desperate that uh, the young architect said that, oh my goodness, Lou, what's going on? What has happened to you? And then Louis Kahn said, oh, Le Corbusier, he has died. And uh, the young architect said, yeah, but that's already six months ago. And Louis Kahn said, yes, but to whom from now on should I design my buildings to? He was thinking Le Corbusier as his hero, and he was delivering his work, doing his creative work for Le Corbusier. And that's the idea of the hero. You are giving something to him through your work. You are continuing that uh, flow, that creative flow. You are, you are taking it to the next step, to the, to the future. It's like that's the idea see. when... Uh, then Am Amalia Earhart, the pioneer of aviation, she said when she yes. left to her final flight, she said that, listen, I have to take this flight. I know this is difficult, dangerous, and could be that I'm not going to come back to return. But then there are other women who, who will continue from that. And that's the yeah. idea, idea of heroes and, uh, and sheroes. You pick them because you feel that I'm on the same path and I will carry on that path. But it was so beautiful, the idea that whom I, I am going to do my work from now on. And he was the big name at that point. Mm. So uh, pick up your heroes and sheroes wisely. And you should have both heroes and sheroes, <laughs> I think. Right. 
You've you've mentioned a few of your uh, heroes and sheroes throughout this conversation and in our previous conversations. Is there a hero or shiro that you have who you do your work for, who inspires you to sort of honor them through uh, through the leadership and creative work that you do? I can't say it. Could be my father. I'm on the same path. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> to say, you. Don't tell him. Don't tell him. <laughs> I won't. That's no, a tough but, one to escape. But seriously, <laughs> but seriously, a person who helped me a lot as a hero in the beginning of my uh, design uh, leadership career, when I uh, went mm-hmm. to work at Kone uh, Corporation, was actually Stefano Marciano, an architect and designer who was at that time the head of design at Philips. Uh, uh, okay. And uh, and uh, I, I was thinking that when I entered to Kone, I was thinking of, uh, that uh, whom should I follow? I mean, that what kind of road model can I take? It was a kind of into, intuitive way of trying to figure out what kind of uh, leadership uh, model I'm going to have in the future. So I, I remember that he had done fantastic work by transforming the everyday goods, you know, household appliances, the so-called, um, uh, how should I say, unknown white goods to a branded one with, uh, with a kind of uh, looks, look and feeling so that you can put them as a centerpiece in your kitchen because he hired all the best Italian designers to redesign those gadgets. So I, I think that he, he made that uh, fantastic transformation from not design to something that has a unique value in terms of design. So I contacted him after one uh, conference and asked that, uh, I I have noticed that you also collaborate with companies that are not competitors, of course, but you collaborate uh, or Philips Design is collaborating with different uh, companies. And uh, then we ended up to have a series of workshops together basically uh, on around the idea of ambient design because I wanted to create something mm. different uh, to the elevator uh, interiors, not just, you know, the, the, the standard steel materials, but something more sensitive. So it was very, very uh, good support for my thinking that you can change the whole uh, approach in a business, basically through design. So I was very happy uh, a few years so, ago when, when I met him and I, I, I said that, thank you <laughs> for my hero. <laughs> All right. Wonderful. Yeah. And they say, never meet your heroes, but uh, yeah. I'm glad that went well. Yeah, but it was, it was wonderful short discussion with him. Yeah. He appreciated it and I okay, appreciate great. it. Yeah. You mentioned you mentioned in your earlier uh, response, and maybe this is a good segue because you alluded to this concept of design in business here as well. This notion of strategic design, and whilst I I, I wouldn't go so far as to say a hero, I'm a really big fan of uh, a book recently actually called uh, Trojan Horses, a design vocabulary by Dan Hill, who you may have crossed paths with at Helsinki Design Lab. I, I'm not sure if you're. Uh, if you're if you've been colleagues, if you were there at the same time, if you if you worked with Dan uh, Hill or not? No, unfortunately. But I just yesterday it happened to listen uh, one uh, uh, seminar, virtual seminar, where he gave a talk. So he's based in uh, Stockholm now, okay. <laughs> and you know, and Sweden, yes, yes, we I, are I have... like cats and dogs <laughs> in a good sense. <laughs> <laughs> But, but on the topic of strategic design, I, I learned a lot about this concept from Dan Hill's book. And he speaks about uh, this concept of dark matter. And I, I, f- I feel like you alluded to it as well. And I wanted to read a little bit of an excerpt from uh, the book, a very short excerpt, and just get your take on this. And then maybe if for the audience benefit, uh, particularly for the, for the leaders who have a lot of exposure to the idea of strategy, but not necessarily strategic design, if you could explain from your perspective what strategic design means. But I'll read this uh, excerpt first. So this is about this concept of dark matter. 
and Daniel writes, the only way that dark matter can be perceived is by implication, through its effect on other things, essentially its gravitational effects on more easily detectable matter. With a product, service, or artifact, the user is rarely aware of the organizational context that produced it, yet the outcome is directly affected by it. Dark matter is the substrate that produces. The dark matter of strategic designers is organizational culture, policy environments, market mechanisms, legislation, finance models, and other incentives, governance structures, tradition and habits, local culture and national identity, the habitats, situations, and events that decisions are produced within. This may well be the core mass of the architecture of society, and if we want to shift the way society functions, a facility with dark matter must be part of the strategic designer's toolkit. So Anne, I, I wanted to ask you, what does strategic design mean to you? And if you could perhaps also segue into my next question, which is, why is inclusivity important? And maybe to the audience, this might sound like they're very two very different random questions. But I actually feel strategic design and this idea of inclusivity, bringing in more inclusivity into leadership through the lens of strategic design is actually quite an integrated concept. And, and maybe we could talk about that a little bit. Well, first about the dark matter, it, it's... Uh, oh. When you read it as a list, it uh, it looks like a design brief for a city, right? <laughs> when uh, I mean <laughs> that point. culture, policy, finance, uh, identity, you know, mm. governance, all that. So, but uh, seriously, I learned two days ago uh, uh, a concept called warm data, and that that <laughs> I only heard about that, that two days ago myself. What a coincidence! Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I think it's emerging now. But but that is actually uh, uh, it means that all the data that is uh, context based. Mm. So you can't just take few highlights here and there, but you have to take the richness of the context. For example, if you do uh, knowledge based uh, decisions, you have to listen to the warm data, not just, you know, how many people are moving into the cities and how many people are moving out of the cities. That is very, very simple. And then do the strategy for the next five years, right? Mm -hmm. But when I entered to the city of Helsinki as a chief design officer, I realized uh, in the day one that they were preparing the next five year strategy for the city uh, government. So basically they were doing the traditional uh, strategy planning. They, they were looking the numbers behind and then they projected them to the future, only numbers. And uh, based on uh, based on those, they then started to to sort of de uh, redefine what the future could be. But what I I uh, told them, I suggested them that listen, this is not enough today that you do this sort of uh, look to the back mirror and then you just uh, put the numbers to the future. But is it possible that I can do a kind of scenario project uh, parallel to this uh, strategic uh, project or this um, uh, strategy planning? And they didn't know uh, what is coming, so they said yes. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, together with my uh, dear friend Minna, who is based in London, she is a trend researcher. So uh, we used to do this for CONES, so we, we knew how to uh, approach this topic. So uh, we created, uh, first we checked the trends in, in city, uh, uh, I mean, in the city life more than in city planning. But we, we sort of took the highlights, what's going on in the city scene. And we noticed that this, Citizen experience is a big thing in the future. So we built a scenario map around the idea of citizen experience and citizen involvement. 
And that was uh, in 1916, uh, uh, 2016, 2017. And we, we created also four personas to support those scenarios. And then we started the rollout of 12 different workshops with the top city leaders in each of them. And we had also a Scandinavian test group that uh, did one of the workshops. And little by little out of these discussions based on the scenarios and the personas there. And I even asked young architects to create city scenes for these scenarios by 2050 came out the, you know, the ideas, how we can see the future and, and what is the favorable future and what is the plausible future. And those 250 city leaders in Helsinki, they, they uh, told me, most of them, that this is the first time they ever had a value discussion about the five-year strategy of the city. And it was incredible because the people, they started to use these scenarios and personas as tools for their departments also, how to, to create the ideas about the future of the city. So in my mind, this was a very good example how uh, designers can do strategic work. If we give a visual format for that future, that foreseen future, people can uh, reflect their emotions, their ideas, their expectations, their threats, uh, you know, all those kind of things uh, through this kind of process. And it's a co-creation process too at the same time because in the end we created out of these rollouts of workshops we created a vision map uh, for Helsinki uh, one mm. visualization about the the future of the city and what kind of steps we we need to go towards that so in my mind this is this is the most important thing of creative people how they can uh, participate to the building of the future. And uh, now I'm worried because I haven't seen anything like this going on during this post-COVID discussion. Let's say post-COVID discussion about cities or design or you name it. And I'm looking for this kind of movements like Archigram in 1960s, 70s in UK where these architects, young architects after the Second World War, they wanted to freedom for their ideas. So they created the walkables, uh, walking city, the instant city. Those scenarios that are existing now, we are living through those scenarios that they foresee 60 years ago. And also hmm. uh, recently I noticed a very good article about Memphis Group who created the, the idea for the postmodern movement. And that was very radical on its time. And it, they were all created by designers, architects, creative people, because they gave the visual format, either in format of products, objects, or buildings, or scenarios, or, you know, mostly they yeah. started from exhibitions. So where are these new rebels, <laughs> radicals, <laughs> yeah, that show the way yeah. towards the future? Where are they? Tell me, yeah. please. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great question. And I wish I could say this person, this person, this person, this person, and I can't. But what, I, what, what you made me think about is really appreciating some of the work that I'm involved with the government here in Australia. And a lot of it, I, I won't go into detail uh, right now, but a lot of it is inspired by the Daskopta report, which I know you reference in a lot of your work as well, because uh, you, you talk quite a bit about nature. And maybe this is going to have to be for a part two, where we talk more about the yeah. relationship of nature with cities. But uh, but I know that there is a lot of inspiration that came from the Daskopta review for people to care more about really radically 
reimagining our nature, our relationship with nature, our relationship with environment, our relationship with those things around us. And it's occurred to me that the way that you described the qualities that go into strategic design, a lot of it is not about the things that people typically associate with design, like creativity or even particularly visual creativity. It has a lot to do with empathy. It has a lot to do with a sense of being able to envision a more holistic uh, future. And it made me think of a, a quote by Albert Einstein that I had written down. I really, really love the full form of this quote often I share, but uh, the short sort of contraction of it is that our task must be to free ourselves by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature and its beauty. And yeah. Einstein speaks about this idea of, you know, looking at the universe very holistically and collectively. And it makes me think about inclusivity as you were talking about it, that when you bring diverse perspectives to the table, but also minority perspectives like women, indigenous voice, ethnic groups, a lot of times, all of a sudden, the capacity for empathy and the capacity for widening our circle of compassion seems to expand. Has that been your experience as well? Is that how you also think of the value of yes. inclusivity? Yeah, yeah. And especially uh, if you uh, read this fantastic book by also, excuse me, Edward Wilson called uh, Biophilia. It's a uh, book from uh, 1980s. I love it. He's talking about this uh, human bond with other spices, meaning in a broad sense. And also he's reflecting the idea that he as a, an ecologist or biologist, he can learn from culture, from arts to understand better what is the DNA of human beings among other species. And also he's talking that the, the not only scientists can learn from artists and creatives, but vice versa that the more we know about science, the more we understand about the life and world in, in general, and more open we are for, for this idea of inclusivity, for example, and equity and all those. So I think that this pandemic year has made most of us to, to understand and respect a kind of, how should I say, the quintessential values of nature and uh, uh, also including other human beings. So I think that uh, what I would love to see in the future is something that is radical enough to create a movement related to this uh, idea of uh, human beings as a part of the, the mother earth or one, uh, how should I say that we, uh, oneness with nature. So yeah. I think that uh, we have to start to, to reconsider what is our position on the earth. I mean that, uh, how can we see ourselves so much superior to something, let's say uh, insects or birds or anything on the earth that, that uh, we can go on like we have been doing during the past uh, several decades. So this is the time to, to reconsider, reimagine, redesign, and you know, re-everything basically. But I'm looking for this kind of new movements and I'm happy to join them and I'm happy to start them, but, <laughs> but we need a little bit <laughs> more people to join, <laughs> join the forces. Yeah. So I have a, a very dear, a uh, colleague and friend of mine. I asked him if he had any questions that uh, would be good to ask you as well. And he had a uh, one of the questions that he asked, I think ties in really neatly with everything that you've just said. It's the most logical next question to ask. So I'll read it as I wrote it, which is, what is the role of design in terms of bringing nature and beauty together in an urban landscape to deal with mental health and social isolation? It's a crucial role. It's the bridge builder's role, 
I mean that this human nature connection, it can happen in many levels, in mental level, in physical level. I mean, you can remember places where natural places where you have visited, and then you might have a worry about the climate change, for example. So it can uh, happen in many levels, this uh, connection. But if you think about design, it can happen all these levels too. It can, uh, through design, you can support the mental health by applying, let's say, biophilic design, bringing in the elements of uh, nature and uh, using natural materials and having the, uh, the daylight in the, the space, et cetera, et cetera. Or, it could be something that is related to the uh, nearby nature, your neighborhood, so that, uh, for example, you can help to, to design an, an app that is open for everyone and they can find, you know, the nearest neighbor, uh, nearest nature places there, blue spaces, green spaces. And in a city level, especially, you can uh, enhance the role of blue spaces, green spaces for, uh, for people to enjoy. So there are many, many levels here. And also, when we discuss about the, the well-being and human nature connection, there is always this certain notion about uh, community spirit that is interesting. That, that's sort of part of it. And that is exactly the door to less uh, lonely urban environment. If we can enhance this uh, community spirit, let's say put uh, something natural next to that. I mean that the communal gardens, they are wonderful things, for example, for people to gather together and help each other and create a, a kind of spirit uh, among the people uh, doing uh, work there uh, mm. with uh, different plants. So I think that it's crucial, like I said in the beginning, because it's, it, it can uh, rebuild this human nature connection in many levels, not only in one level, but in many, many, many levels. To be honest with you, I don't really think of myself as a designer, but now I feel after this conversation, I am thinking myself more in terms of design leadership. And that uh, probably segues into the last question for this conversation. I, I definitely want to have a part two and <laughs> trust me, I feel like we can talk for a lot. And you've been so generous with your time. I'm extremely grateful. Uh, I, I hope this conversation has been enjoyable for you as well. Uh, so sure. before we <laughs> great, before we wrap up, one question I have. So the name of, of this show that you're on is called Lead by Design. And I'm really curious to know, from your perspective, what do you think it means? And what do you think it looks like when you see someone who leads by design? And in contrast, what does it look like when someone is not leading by design? Hmm, that's a tough one. Well, in my mind, as I have said so many times during this uh, conversation now, uh, mm -hmm. leadership is about uh, future. Leadership is about how to navigate towards the future. So if I see... Um, somebody who I consider a leader in terms of design, he or she is usually a very visionary person, must be. There must be some kind of visionary thinking. And also, like I said, that this uh, certain, not aura, but spirit of a tour, I take the responsibility of this. Not in, in, in a way that, oh, I want to be a big name. Not, not a big ego, but, you know, a big eco, meaning that uh, I take the responsibility. And uh, then the other part of the question was that if, if there is not <laughs> this leadership element or what, what was the second question? The last part of um, that. In, in, in contrast, how do you notice if somebody is 
not is, is lead, lacking, but they're not leading yeah. by design. Yeah, they're leading not, by not without leading. design. Yeah, well, usually then it's without this vision. There's no mm. vision. It's just doing, making, improving. Well, that's life too. I mean, that's important too. But it's not leadership. Then you are a manager. You are doing your job, a good job. But you are not in the leadership level, in your leadership phase. Not yet. I think that's the, the, the difference. And also there is one thing. When you start as a leader, usually you have to gain your skills and you know, uh, learn a lot of uh, things, how to do your craft, basically. But then when you go further on your journey to leadership, then uh, you start to support others to do their best. Like the conductor, you know, you give the, the, the space uh, for those people to show their best. You give the floor for them. Let, let them shine, like I said. So I think that's the, the difference in my mind. The, the more you are leader, the more you let people shine, other people than you yourself. That is such a fantastic answer. And thank you so much for your time. I'm extremely, extremely grateful for your uh, generosity and your passion. And I'm extremely grateful for your vision. You being such a great exemplar and inspiration for people who are committed to leading by design. So thank you for that. Thanks for being on the show. Is there anything else that you would like to say to the audience before we wrap up? Anything that you're working on that you'd like to talk about? Anything at all? Well, thank you for your kind words. It has been a pleasure and very inspiring to, to discuss with you with your insightful questions. Maybe there is one thing uh, in the end that I want to highlight that uh, we don't have to define everything by words. Like I said, I created this vision map for myself based, based on images. And I don't even know where it will take me, but I know that this is a kind of uh, uh, one way to find it. So we have to trust our intuition and our vision with full heart and passion. It will carry on. Like uh, Louis Kahn, the architect I already mentioned, he said that it, it's very difficult to define architecture because architecture is. So in the same way, leadership is and design is. You don't have to always, you know, the, it can be design is period. And we all can find our own ways to to do it and to see it and to share it. That's that's so beautiful. You know, one of one of your inspirations, Don Norman, uh, Donald Norman wrote uh, once. I, this is one of the quotes that I had in my notes. He said, "I think there is a tendency in science to measure what is measurable and to decide that what you cannot measure must be uninteresting." And I feel like what you just said is such a beautiful elaboration on that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, we should, uh, we should definitely have a nec uh, next chapter for this discussion. <laughs> I'm looking the, forward to it. In the near future, yes. <laughs> looking forward Thank to it. So Thanks much. again, and yeah. really appreciate it. Thanks for making it to the end of this episode. You'll be able to find the show notes and more at my website over at leadbydesign.show. I really hope you enjoyed this, and if you did, then I have a request for you. Subscribe to the podcast wherever you're watching or listening to it. And share this episode with someone directly who you believe would benefit from this conversation. Thanks for listening.